Good morning. Would you please stand with us? Let's have a word of prayer before we start the service. Father God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here together and worship you. Thank you for your son Jesus and the gift of salvation. Be with us in the message today. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a new song we're going to play today. It's kind of an adventurous, upbeat one. So we'll need your help clapping on this one. Down to that river, guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash it all away. Have you been searching, carrying burdens? You've been lost and looking for a home. If you've been drifting, something is missing. You should know that you are not alone. Hey. Brother, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash it all away. Come on down to the river. Come as you are, no time to waste. Open your heart, don't be afraid. Jump on in, the water is fine. It's healing in the river of life. Cause you are no time to waste. Open your heart, don't be afraid. Jump on in, the water is fine. It's healing in the river of life. Brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same.
Thank you. Take a moment and greet one another. Okay, we're going to get started this morning. We're going to get started with some announcements. Last one to their seat has to preach today on my topic. I have to give you the topic. You have no. Gets real quiet when you throw that out there. 
Now, just a few announcements uh, this morning as we get started. Um, great to see Donna Reedy's here, second row. <laughs> Glad to see you back this morning. I know we still have some folks that are still out you know, with some health things, and so let's just continue to be praying for them. You know, they can be back with us soon, very soon. So um, I also want to share this with you. Um, this is from the family of Eleanor Heckman. We had their the funeral service last Friday, and the hills are in the back there. I just want to share this with you from their whole family. We would like to give our thanks to the, for the use of the church. We would also like to thank the ladies for providing the meal. We thank you for your support and prayers during this difficult time. So from the, the family of the Heckman. So let's keep praying for them you know, as we go about our week. You know, it, the service might be over, but that doesn't always, it doesn't change like that. So be in prayer for them for sure. Um, just another few announcements. Let's see who we can embarrass today. There's got to be somebody we can embarrass. Um, Pam Hofer, it's her birthday. Is she here today? Oh, she's sleeping. Oh, okay. Well, when you see her, tell her happy birthday. <laughs> what a way to spend your birthday, right? And I know Kathy Wojcik is here today. Happy birthday to Kathy. <laughs> Sandy Sappington, happy birthday. So those are the ones we get to embarrass today. So happy birthday. If you've had this week, you know, hope you have a great, great birthday as well. Um, so a few other announcements. Middle Ground, Jason's over here, and Elena, you can talk to them if you're interested in Middle Ground. But they're going to be meeting Friday, 6 o'clock p.m. at their house. So they're hosting. So if you need directions or you have questions on Middle Grounds, make sure you visit with them. Uh, the Women's Lunch Bunch, Wednesday, this week. So make sure you sign up in the foyer if you're planning on going to that. Um, Joy Group. Took a little breather, but they're coming back here May 9th. So I think they're doing a sign-up. It might be in the foyer. Is it in the foyer? Sign up in the foyer for some items they're going to do for a lunch. So if you have a few things they need, if you take a look at that, if you're part of Joy Group. And then next Sunday, 4 p.m., right, Leona? 4 p.m., Awana Grand Prix. So if you want to come and watch the car races, um, that's going to be next Sunday here in the Memorial Building at 4 o'clock. And Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. So if you can put it on your phone, it's real easy. You can set a reminder. You know how to do that? You don't even have to enter it. You can just say, hey, Siri, which everybody's phone probably just went off, right? <laughs> set a reminder for National Day of Prayer th Thursday. Take just a little time, pray for our church. We're going through a lot of transition. Pray for our church, pray for our community, pray for the country, neighbors. National Day of Prayer this Thursday. So make sure you, you set your calendar for that. And then next Sunday, it's hard to believe we're getting close to graduation, but it's, it's coming. And so next Sunday, we're going to recognize our graduating seniors. If you're on the back of your bulletin, you'll see the list. we got a whole bunch. So we want to recognize them next year, next year, next Sunday. They'll be gone next year. And we're going to have a little reception for them following the morning service out in the foyer. So if, if you want to bring a card, you have something you want to... This is going to be a great time to do that. We'll have that in the foyer following the main service for our graduates. Um, so we're going to take a moment. We're going to pray for those in our church who are experiencing loss. I um, want to pray for Donna Cole. She's here with us this morning, but her daughter passed away, and we want to pray for her and um, the Hilzer family and the Heckman family. And then for those who are still struggling just with different illness things. There's just junk going and keeping people out. I've been a victim of that, I feel like, constantly the last two weeks. So we're going to pray for uh, our, our church body. So let's do that together. God, we come before you. You know our needs. You know what we're going to ask before we ask. But you desire for us to come in a relationship with you that you have restored so we can lay before your feet the things that we have that are concerning us. And Lord, the things that we could list probably more than we could imagine of praises that so many times would go unspoken. We thank you for those things, God, and how you have blessed us in this church and this, our families and in this body that you've created. But we pray, Lord, for those experiencing loss today, and we pray that you would be with them and that you would comfort them and they would find hope and encouragement in your word today. Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with different illnesses and aren't able to be here, Lord, that you would just bring healing to their bodies and restore them, that they would be here to worship you. And so we just, again, thank you for the opportunity to come before you in prayer this morning. We pray you would take all of our needs, those spoken and unspoken today, and you would meet them for your kingdom and for your glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we go on, we're going to uh, probably embarrass a few more people this morning because that's kind of the theme. 
you know, we have a, a number of people who have desired to become members of the church. And so I thought about making you all stand, but you're going to have to come up front, okay? You're gonna, I'll, I'll make you, you'll be up here with me and the others. You won't be up here by yourself. But we definitely want to recognize you, and we just want to pray for you. And then as a congregation, we just want to speak a word of encouragement to you. So I'm going to invite the Lors up, Rod and Darla, and then the Ophingas are going to come up, Billy and Jaylene, and then is Becky Walker here? There she is. I didn't see her this morning, but she's here. Come on up. I'll let you guys just line up right here. And we're so thankful for you guys being a part of this body and in your contributions, not only your witness, but your service of this church. And for I know many for years, so we're so glad, you know, that you're, that you're here with us. Isn't this awesome? And, you know, we, we do this membership thing, you know, to recognize them, you know, being a part. But it, the commitment already began here in your hearts. You know, we give you a certificate to say, you know, your membership piece. But we know that your hearts are devoted to the Lord. And that's what's exciting to me. So we're just going to take a moment and pray for you. Before we do that, you know, it's not just about them. Because th when they're part of our body and they make a commitment to be with us in the thick and the thin, that means all of us are receiving them into this body as they're willing to join it, okay? Now, we're going to put it up on the screen. We have a, a congregational response, but this is our prayer for you guys and our hearts to you as you are part of our body, okay? So let's say this together to them, all of us here. We affirm and welcome you into our fellowship, and we pray and encourage and grow with you in the Lord. So let's take a moment and pray. God, I thank you so much for each one up here this morning. And, and Lord, they're, they're coming up, and, and even in an uncomfortable way, happen to stand up here, Lord, but they are committed to you. And we're so thankful that they're committed to serving in this body and being examples of, of your followers in this, in this church. And so, Lord, we pray you would bless them. Bless them in their individual lives. Bless them in their growth. And we pray you bless the work of their hands as they participate in the different things in this body and they serve, we pray, God, you would just bring an abundant harvest and make it fruitful. We pray you for all of us that we would continue to encourage them, growing with them, lifting them up as needed. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give you guys a certificate. I'll let you come down. Yes, of course. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. I think I'm going to invite Joe to come. She's going to lead us in some time of continued worship this morning. Good morning. I have a little, little funny to tell this morning. Tim has gone to South Dakota. He's coming home sometime late today. So all the awful, wonderful things that he does for me, like the chores in the morning on Sunday morning so I can get ready and get mom ready, I did myself today. So on the way out the driveway, I'm going to the fields to let the horses out and tiptoeing through manure in my heels. And, and I got back in the car and I said, man, I hope nobody cares how my, my feet smell today. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, you know, you're probably not the only one. And I said, you know what, I love in a rural community because she's probably right. There's probably others that tiptoed through road apples to get before they came to church this morning. So I'm pretty excited about that. So anyway, if you all will stand, we're going to sing our first, ver our first hymn, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. <laughs>
seated. The men can come forward to get the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your house and to share in praises and worship, Lord. And we just ask that you would bless this offering. Use it to further your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. That was awesome. Can you stand for the doxology, please? Revive us again, all four verses.
to go. Okay, I'd like to invite all the children up at this time to join me uh, for the children's message. And I'm going to move this. And I'm going to sit in the chair this time, so we're going to come a little bit further up here, if that's okay. Everybody come sit around me. Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Awesome. Hey, puppy. All right, let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here safely this morning, and I just pray that you open our hearts and minds to our little message this morning, Lord, and um, be with us this week, Lord, and thank you for your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I brought something this morning. I hope you all know what this is. What is this? Yes. Yes. You use it to brush your teeth. Okay. Hang on. Watch. I'm going to show you. Okay. Watch careful. Don't do this at home. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Satisfying. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay. I have it all squeezed out and I made a big mess. You see it? Okay. Shh. Now I need help with the next part. Who wants to help me? Okay. I want to see if one of you can put it all back inside for me. Do any th does anybody think they can do that? You want to try? I don't know. I don't think we can. It'd be really hard. I don't think we. I don't think we can get it. So, why do you guys? Why do you guys think I did that? Why do you think? I did waste it. <laughs> Isn't it? You're not supposed to do that. You're right. That actually kind of makes me sad as a mom. I don't like seeing wasted toothpaste. Did you know that there's something else that is exactly the same as my wasted toothpaste? It's something about our words. Sometimes we say things we shouldn't say that are hurtful. And then maybe you said something hurtful to a friend, and they said, please take it back. Can you take it back? No. no. It's, already been said. it's already been said. It's already been squeezed out of the toothpaste. Okay, so you really so I did. If you can't put the words away and you've done things you shouldn't have done, just like the toothpaste, then why, why do we need to be careful to, to, with what we're saying? Isn't that pretty important? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a couple verses here. In Proverbs 12, 18, it says, reckless words are like a sword. That's scary, isn't it? And it's true. How many of you have been hurt by bad words that somebody has said to you that hurts your feelings? It, it kind of feels like a sword through the heart, doesn't it? There's another verse in the Bible. These are more of God's words. Listen. Proverbs 10, 19. He who holds his tongue is wise. What do you guys think that means? That if you hold your tongue that and you think about what you say that you're not hurting other people. He got it right on. That is exactly true. It doesn't mean hold your tongue like this. It doesn't mean that. And I have one more verse. Ready? It is from Psalm 1914, and it says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It's important to be pleasing to God, isn't it? Why do we want to please him? Lots of reasons. So he loves us? He'll love us even if we don't please him. His love is always unconditional. But when we have him in, his heart, in our heart, we, we want to do what's right. We want to be examples and lead our friends. So I, as I was putting this together, I thought of a very special song. And I think some of you will know it. And if you know it, can you, can you sing it for me? I'm going to start it. I'm not a singer. My kids are probably cringing back there. But... Um, 
Becca knows the song, so I asked her if she could help me with it. You okay with that still? Okay, come stand up here so they can hear your voice over mine. Okay, here we go. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. You don't know this? How many people out there know it? Everybody, pretty much, hopefully. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down below. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down below. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. For the Father up above is looking down below. So be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. For the Father up above is looking down below. So be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little heart, who you trust. Oh, be careful, little heart, who you trust. For the Father up above is looking down below. So be careful, little heart, who you trust. Oh, be careful, little mind, what you think. Oh, be careful, little mind, what you think. For the Father up above is looking down below. So be careful, little mind, what you think. Remember those words this week, okay, guys? Thank you for listening. You can go sit, sit back down with your parents. Well, uh, maybe we should just pray and close. I pretty much got me on that one, you know. I don't know if you all felt what I felt on that, but it was a pretty convicting children's message. In fact, I think Jane's been up here so much, we might as well just have her share the message this morning. Do you want to come back? No, we, we won't make her come back up a third time today. Thank you for those words for all of us. That was, that was great. Before we get started, let's just take a moment and pray together today. God, we come before you and we pray that you would just speak to us mightily from your word, that you would reveal your, your plans to us this morning, your grand plan. As we look at this study we've been in for the last few weeks of what happens after Easter, that you're still working, you're still revealing, you're still doing. We pray you would share that with us this morning from your word, that you would just speak to us right where we are. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So over the last two weeks together, we've been looking at these events following Easter. We spent time looking at the preparations being made for the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus' death and resurrection made it possible via the removal of sin from the believer for God to take up residence there. So once the holy ground was prepared by Jesus on the cross, the Holy Spirit was sent to us to be our ever-present guide, our counselor, and our reminder. Okay, so I just gave you the Cliff Notes version of the last two weeks, right? But the Holy Spirit also empowered the new believers to go far beyond what they would have been capable of on their own. And we saw a little bit of that last week. In fact, if you remember, the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling within us begins to change us on the inside in an amazing way. And with sin's power broken, God can really make us into what he wants us to be if we're willing to surrender to him. In fact, 2 Corinthians says this in chapter 3. It says, that Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, reflecting the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory into glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Now, if you remember, I think we talked about this last week, this transformation is a process, and it takes time. You remember that from last week? 
despite our process and our struggle with it, God in his love and in his patience and his grace, he still uses us in this process to accomplish amazing work. And that's if we will believe and we'll really trust him in that. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you because the power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, rather, I will boast more gladly in my weakness in order that the power of Christ might reside in me. See, God doesn't need us to be perfect, but he does need us willing to walk with him by faith. After Easter, when Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit came to change the believers from the inside and empower them to complete the work that God had desired to do through them on the outside. And so this morning, I want to take kind of a finishing big picture look so we can understand why the cross, why the resurrection, and why Pentecost are so important together and individually going forward, okay? But we're going to have to go back a moment to start, okay? Now, one thing I've found when you look through your Bible, and you've probably, many of you have done this cover to cover, it's clear that God hasn't abandoned what he wanted to do in Eden. We think that with the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden, that the original intention and the plan of God was expelled as well. We sometimes think that God gave up on the grand idea of having a human family with him, residing in their midst, and he further gave up plans then for a kingdom under his rule spreading across the world he created. However, God's mission hasn't changed, and it's still in place. Adam and Eve's sin in the garden did not undo the plan. In fact, God brought Christ through Adam and Eve, and then through Christ empowered the children of Adam and Eve for the work of restoring what was lost in Eden. There's this command in the Old Testament. You've probably heard this. It's called the Edenic Mandate. Has anybody ever heard of this before? Good, no one, perfect. You're gonna learn something today. We actually find it in the book of Genesis a couple times. It begins in Genesis 1, verse 28. Here's what it says. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have you ever heard that verse before? Yes, the Edenic mandate. However, man became so sinful that God destroyed the earth and almost everything in it. Noah was spared with his family, if you recall. And right after God had destroyed the earth with this flood, he says this to Noah as he's about to start things again. In Genesis 9, verse 1, look what he says. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The Edenic mandate. God hasn't given up on the mandate. This is the plan he began with, and he continues with to this day. Humanity has been tasked with taking his image and spreading it through the whole earth. God desired to have a people who reflected him, enjoyed the beauty of his creation, and walked with him in their work of managing it, filling it. Now, that was the command to Adam and Noah. But after the events of Noah, even though the mandate had been given again, the descendants of Noah did not follow the command. You probably remember this, too. Genesis chapter 11, here it is, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to each other, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had tar for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top reaches to the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Now did you catch the last line there, the people declared they would not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. They had moved east and they settled down one place together. 
And further then, they tried to build a tower that would make it possible to have God on their terms. That was the idea. These people were rejecting God's plans and were instead saying, we'll make our own plans. Remember the Edenic mandate. Man was to be fruitful and multiply, ultimately spreading the influence and the kingdom of God and God's character throughout the whole earth. Instead, what did man do? They settled together and pridefully attempted to boast in themselves and their accomplishments. That wasn't what God desired, and so he did something about it. Notice what he does. Genesis 11, verse 5. Then Yahweh came down to the city and the tower that humankind was building. And Yahweh said, Behold, they are one people with one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. So now nothing that they intend to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down, confuse their language there, so that they will not understand each other's language. So Yahweh scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, for there Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth, and there Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Familiar with this story a little bit? They wouldn't obey God, so God scattered them by specifically confusing their language. The event at Babel is looked back upon as really the dividing point in history. Not only had man abandoned the Edenic mandate, but the entire world was now changed dramatically. After Babel, people groups formed based on their specific languages, and they spread out over the face of the earth. And with it came something significant that I think many times we have a tendency to either forget or overlook, or maybe we've never even heard. But God actually outlined it to the Israelites some years later at Sinai. Look at what he says in Exodus 20, verse 3. There shall be for you no other gods before me. Have you heard that one before? You shall not make for yourself a divine image with any form that is in the heavens above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water below the earth. You will not bow down to them and you will not serve them because I am Yahweh, your God, a jealous God. In the time before Babel, there's no record that we have in the Bible of people serving other gods. Do you realize that? But after Babel, people started to worship the stars, the heavenly bodies, the host of heaven, the earth, and we see the appearance of other gods. In a warning to the Israelites by Moses, it actually became clear what took place at Babel. He goes all the way back, and he explains to the people of Israel what would happen to them if they rejected God. And he reveals the connection to Babel. Here it is, Deuteronomy 29, verse 24. And all the nations will say, why has Yahweh done such a thing to this land? What caused the fierceness of this great anger? And they will say, it is because they abandoned the covenant of Yahweh, the God of their ancestors, which he made with them when he brought them out from the land of Egypt And they went and served other gods and bowed down to them, gods whom they did not know, and he had not allotted to them. The Hebrew word there for allotted is halak. It literally means apportioned, divided, and distributed. Scholars believe that it was at this moment at Babel that God placed heavenly administrators over the nations over all the different people groups of the earth. What was once a direct relationship with him, God says no more, and now there's mediators and there's administrators involved. And instead of the host of heaven guiding the people to Yahweh, the peoples of the earth began to worship them as gods. And the nations were born. It was the Babel event at which God rejected humanity as a whole It was at this moment that we find in the following chapters of Genesis that God called Abraham and he told him that he had been chosen by God to be the vessel from which he would bring forth his own people. What God would actually call his portion, his allotment, his inheritance. 
Now, to fulfill the Edemic mandate, God would raise a people in the line of Abraham who, by faith like Abraham, believed in him. And these followers, as workers in God's kingdom, would be the instruments he would use to go and reclaim the people of the earth and free them from the dominion of the gods they were worshiping. Do you know that was going on? And this process would be threefold. Sanctify the holy ground through the blood sacrifice, Jesus, on the cross. Take up residence on that holy ground, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and then start reclaiming the people of the nations. And here's where Pentecost comes in, folks. There are some amazing similarities between the story of Babel and Pentecost. And I don't think they're coincidental at all. God, through the disciples, through the New Testament believers, and all the way to us, was about to undo Babel. That's what was coming next after Jesus' ascension, and that's what is coming next for us. I want you to look at this. This is amazing. Acts chapter 2. You might remember this. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in the same place. And suddenly a sound like a violent rushing wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And divided tongues like fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak out. Now there were Jews residing in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd gathered and was in confusion because each one was hearing them speaking in his own language. Here again, listen to this, Genesis 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top reaches to the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So Yahweh scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, for there Yahweh confused their language, and there Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, did you catch all the similarities there? Jesus had instructed the disciples to stay together in one place in Jerusalem so that God would come down upon them. At Babel, the people against God's command gathered together in one place so they could, in pride, build their own kingdom. And God came down not to empower them, but to divide them. Genesis 11.8, So Yahweh scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Isn't it ironic that where God once divided the nations at Babel, now in Jerusalem where his followers are gathered together in one place, his command. It's actually the same language used. Acts chapter 2, verse 3. And divided tongues like fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And there's more. Acts 2, 4. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak out. Now there were Jews residing in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. Genesis 11.9 says, Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth, and Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Isn't it interesting that he uses that language? You know, I confused their language. And then here you have Acts chapter 2, verse 6. Look what it says. And when the sound occurred, the crowd gathered and was in confusion. Do you see all these similarities? God has a purpose in keeping these men together in Jerusalem. It was from his capital, his historical dwelling place, that they would go out to conquer the nations by his spirit for his kingdom. This is in contrast with sinful humanity's capital, which is represented throughout the Bible by Babel and under the name Babylon or Babylon the Great. Have you heard that before? Babylon's people and its kingdom is the world's kingdom. 
It is built on pride, on power, on human achievement without God. In fact, C.S. Lewis actually wrote and said this is what he calls the anti-God state of mind. And this idea goes not just way into the past, but it also goes way into the future. John says this in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2. He says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And it has become a dwelling place of demons and a haunt of every unclean spirit and a haunt of every unclean bird and a haunt of every unclean and detested animal. For all the nations of the earth have drunk from the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality and the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich from the power of her sensuality. Woe, woe to the great city, Babylon, the powerful city, because in one hour, your judgment has come. See, Babylon is actually bigger than a tower. Throughout the Bible, Babylon becomes the metaphor, the imagery for the system which defines a godless society and world. It's the capstone illustration of humanity's determination to do it themselves trust in themselves, and it represents people coming together to reject God, embrace lawlessness and idolatry and unrestrained passions and desires. See, God knew the coming consequences and the damage all the way back in Genesis 11, verse 5. He says, as he's taken Babel down, behold, they are one people with one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. So now nothing they intend to do will be impossible for them. I don't think that was a good statement. What prideful, sinful man would do would be devastating. However, at Pentecost, with new hearts of flesh within the believers, and by the work of Christ on the cross, and as they gathered in one place, God came down again to them to take up residence within them. And they were then going to be ready to fulfill that Edenic mandate. Ready to be refined by God and ready to go take back God's world for the kingdom. Acts 2's language is a direct link. And it's the plan to undo Genesis 11. Now, do you remember this? Acts chapter 2, here it is. And they were astounded, astonished, saying, Behold, are not those who are speaking Galileans? And how do we hear each one of us in our own native language? And then he goes on to list all these nations and groups of peoples by language. And it goes on to say, And we hear them speaking in our own languages the great deeds of God. These groups actually show up much earlier in the Bible as well. Did you know that? All the way back in Genesis 10. Ironic, that's right before Genesis 11. Babel, but right before that, you have these nations, and it's actually typically called the Table of Nations, ironically. But after listing the nations out in detail, it says this in Genesis 10, verse 32. These are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations and to their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. The nations of the earth, which once were confused in language, rejected by God, and dispersed, are now going to be reclaimed. Acts 2.5. Now there were Jews residing in Jerusalem, devout men from where? Every nation under heaven. These are the Jews who lived outside of Israel. They were residing there in Israel at this time for the Passover, and they came from other nations, every nation of the known world, from that table of nations. And they were there because their faith had drawn them to celebrate the Passover. And it's not by coincidence, folks, that the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension and then Pentecost all happened right at the same time. You may recall that in Jewish history, the Jews were dispersed by God. You ever heard that before? Just like the people of Babel. They fell into idolatry, and so God judged them. And wouldn't you know it, who did he bring? Babylon. 
and they were exiled. They were dispersed throughout the world, but God wasn't done. That was all part of the plan. The Jewish faithful, they believed that they would be brought back together one day. The exile would end. They'd be back in the kingdom of Yahweh and in a place under his dominion and his authority. It is these devout Jews of every nation and the disciples at Pentecost when God came down again. And this time, having accomplished all that was needed on the cross to deal with sin, his people would go forth to take dominion over the earth and reclaim the nations to himself together under his banner. When those Jews left Jerusalem after Pentecost, they returned with the gospel and were God's instruments in the process of taking dominion, not just of cities and towns, but of hearts and minds of people from every nation on this planet. And that's, folks, how we got here today. We have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We are reclaimed holy ground, and we have been given the assurance of eternity through his resurrection and empowered for internal and external reclamation by God's Holy Spirit. If you sit here this morning and you know Christ, you are equipped to be a part of the grand plan of God going all the way back to Genesis. We are his instruments. We have been given gifts and abilities individually so that as a body together under his banner, we can go reclaim hearts and minds for him. And when we've done all we can do, he'll be back. Here's where we started three weeks ago, if you remember. Acts 1, and as they were staring into the sky while he departed, behold, two men in white clothing stood by them who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven like this will come back in the same way you saw him departing into heaven. You and I here this morning are the instruments God has cleansed. He's in the process of changing and he has equipped by his spirit for the outstanding work that remains. When you look around today, you see a concerted effort towards godless globalism. Do you not? It's amazing how through technology and advancements, the language barriers are gone. And when the language barrier is gone and God is not in the picture, godless men start to do what they've always done. They start to build a tower together. A tower to glory so in pride and in arrogance they can declare themselves God. And we know from God's word and his Holy Spirit how that will end, don't we? Revelation 18.10, Woe, woe, the great city, Babylon the powerful city, because in one hour your judgment has come. Today, as followers of Jesus and members of his kingdom, this church, we are tasked with impacting the hearts and minds of every person in every language throughout the whole earth with the gospel and undoing the real problem of Babel. The scattering and the dividing that pride brought forth can be undone when we willingly humble ourselves before Almighty God when we receive his son's gift of salvation and everlasting life and allow his spirit to guide us in his work together with others that are devoted to the kingdom work, through how we live, our language. Isn't it ironic that Jaleen talked about the words with the kids today? We didn't plan that. Through how we live, our language, our work, it's about going to our families our neighbors, our friends, making disciples of Jesus' kingdom and saving those around us from falling with Babylon. That's what's next for us. That was our question, what's next? That's what's next for us. That's why we are here together as a church body with Christ as our head. That's why we should be working together for the cause of Christ. United not by pride and self-service, but rather by the gospel and a desire to obey God 
with changed hearts and minds as were used to reclaim the peoples of the earth for the kingdom for which they were originally intended to belong. You want to see people and families and cities and cultures change? You want to see Satan and the powers of darkness dealt a massive blow? God says start with hearts and minds. I'm going to leave you with this today because the question of what's next that we started three weeks ago after Easter and we've considered all that we've covered, I think it can be summed up clearly and simply by Jesus himself. And so I'm going to leave you with this today. Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all the days until the end of the age. Will you commit to being a part of God's plan for what's next? Let's pray. God, we're so thankful that you've done all the work. You died on the cross for us. You rose from the grave. You sent your spirit to indwell within us, to empower us, to guide us. Because the work of restoring your kingdom is active. And you desire us to be engaged in it. I pray, Lord, as you bring people to mind that we interact with on a daily basis, that we would look at extending your kingdom by sharing the gospel with them. We'd be praying for our missionaries as they go and they do this at the far corners of the earth. Because, Lord, we look for the day when you will come back down the way you left and take over. And so we pray, come quickly, Lord. We pray you would just guide us as we do your work in the meantime. We ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand as the praise team leads us? darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and promise to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Truth of old shall not heal, shall
Let's pray and close the service. Father God, thank you for the message today. Thank you that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and that you have a plan for each and every one of us. Go with us today as we leave the service. In Jesus' name, amen.